Good morning, everybody. We uh, start this session on hypertensive crisis with a simple case scenario. Mr. Anthony, aged 62, is admitted with severe epistaxis. His blood pressure on admission is 210 by 120. The question is, is this an hypertensive emergency? How many of you feel this is an hypertensive emergency? Okay. Well, it could be. No, but by definition, this is hypertensive urgency. So let us look at the definitions. Hypertensive crisis includes hypertensive emergency and urgency. And what is emergency? Severe elevation of blood pressure, more than 180 by 120, complicated by acute, impending, or progressive end organ damage or dysfunction. Whereas in hypertensive urgency, there is severe elevation of blood pressure without evidence of acute, impending, or progressive end organ damage, although the potential may exist. So, it is a crucial difference between the two in terms of end organ damage. Uh, what are the examples of the end organ damage in hypertensive emergencies? They could be neurologic, cardiovascular, or other organ systems involved, like uh, renal insufficiency or eclampsia or retinopathy. The percentages in the brackets denote the incidence amongst all the hypertensive emergencies. The clinical presentations of urgencies, it could be asymptomatic, but usually with headache, anxiety, epistaxis, post-operative hypertension, and preeclampsia, as compared to eclampsia in emergencies. Why is it important to differentiate the two from these clinical features? Is that in urgency, BP may be lowered in a matter of days with oral treatment and on an outdoor basis mostly. Whereas in emergencies, the blood pressure has to be lowered within minutes or hours with IV drugs and in an ICU setting. So the approach is to promptly evaluate the person to identify the clinical status especially to distinguish between emergency and urgency, provide clues to an underlying etiology, because sometimes this kind of emergencies occur due to uh, undetected underlying cause of hypertension, and to select the most appropriate pharmacologic agent and method of administration. Now, what are the principles of treatment in urgency? There is no need of hospital admission, slow and controlled reduction in blood pressure with oral drugs, and a close follow-up. And frequently increasing the dose of the same drug which a patient was already taking could be good enough. In emergency, you require admission to ICU for continued BP monitoring and administration of continuous infusion of titratable and short-acting IV agent, agents, controlled reduction of mean blood pressure to not more than 25% in one hour, or reduction of blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure by 10 to 20%, or 210 millimeters of mercury in one hour, and then if stable, further progressive reduction over 24 hours. The exceptions that one must note is ischemic stroke, where the reduction has to be slower, about 25% in 24 hours, and aortic dissection, where the reduction has to be faster in about 10 to 20 minutes. So these are the exceptions to the rule. Another scenario, Mr. Suresh is admitted with features of acute ischemic stroke with symptom onset four hours ago. His blood pressure on admission is 180 by 110 which is the antihypertensive that should be given to him? Oral beta blockers, IV nicardipine, none of the treat, none, no drugs or sublegual captopril. Anybody for oral beta blockers? No. Anybody for IV nicardipine? There are some people. No treatment? Anybody? Right. Anybody for sublingual captopril? There are some people. Where the correct answer is no treatment. Why? Let us see. Should acute hypertension be treated in ischemic stroke? On the one hand, we feel no, it should not be treated because it, you can maintain the cerebral blood flow to the ischemic, uh, peri-ischemic zone, that is known as the penumbra. But on the other hand, we feel blood pressure should be reduced because if you don't reduce blood pressure, there could be hemorrhagic transformation of the ischemic stroke or there may be cerebral edema due to un untreated hypertension or there could be recurrence of stroke. So the best is the middle path one must reduce, but very slowly. Now, this is a very important slide and gives you two curves. The yellow curve is the relation of cerebral blood flow to the mean arterial blood pressure. 
and you can see the horizontal part is a part where the, there is uh, auto-regulation, so that despite fall in blood pressure, the blood flow is maintained in the cerebrum. And the red line is the red curve, is the curve in a hypertensive patient which is shifted to the right, and so they become more sensitive to lowering of blood pressure. But the important thing is that in stroke, these curves are replaced by a straight line. That means the horizontal part disappears, there is no auto-regulation, and the, blood, the cerebral blood flow is directly dependent on mean arterial blood pressure. And hence it is very important to take care and reduce the blood pressure slowly. This is because the penumbra, the yellow part, is very sensitive to blood pressure reduction. Hence the guidelines mention that if blood pressure is only above 185 by 110 in a stroke patient who is a candidate for reperfusion therapy, only then you start treatment with labetalol or nicardipine in these doses. Other agents could be hydrolyzine or analapridat. And uh, this should be done very slowly, of course. And the other thing is that the BP should be monitored very closely every 15 minutes for two hours and every 30 minutes for six hours, etc. And if BP rises, again, labetalol and nicardipine, which are the best drugs, can be given as infusion. Only if blood pressure is not controlled or diastolic blood pressure is more than 140 could you consider sodium nitroside. Now people who are not candidates, now this person was not a candidate because it's beyond four hours. In them, you can consider lowering only if it is above 220 by 120. Otherwise, you can observe unless other end organ damage or symptoms occur. And a reasonable target is to lower the blood pressure by, as I said, 15 to 25 percent over the first 24 hours. The recent data mentioned that there should be no distinction between people requiring and not requiring reperfusion therapy and the threshold should be 185 by 110 for all. So if only if blood pressure is more than this that you start treatment, otherwise just observe because many of the patients spontaneously reduce their blood pressure over one day. What about intracranial hemorrhage? Again here, on the one hand, if you, increase, if you allow the, uh, uh, if you, uh, allow the blood pressure to go up, the blood flow to the periclot area may be maintained. Whereas if you, uh, if you allow the blood pressure to go up, there may be hematoma expansion and cerebral edema. So, but here things are more clear because it's known that in the first three hours is the time when the hematoma expansion occurs and the most dangerous period and is related to blood pressure. And hence there is no doubt that hematoma expansion is a reality whereas perihematoma ischemia is not a real act, that there is no problem with this, pro this uh, condition. So the blood pressure has to be lowered and the, the, uh, the new recommendation uh, based on these two trials is that in patient pres pres presenting with a systolic blood pressure of 150 to 120, acute lowering of blood pressure to 140 is probably safe and is recommended. So here there is not a big problem and the drugs again, best drugs are labetalol, 5 to 20 milligrams every 15 minutes or infusion and nicardipine, which is usually an infu infusion. Uh, one uh, danger, of course, as you all know, with nitroproside is cyanide toxicity, but the other danger is increase of intracranial pressure. So uh, nitroproside and to some extent nitroglycerin should be avoided in stroke and bleeding. So summarizing hypertension and stroke, the optimal management is balancing of priorities and risks tailoring to situation and monitoring the patient. It is best treated with titratable IV agents and not all patients with acute cerebrovascular events require treatment for hypertension. Most complications seen are seen in hypertensive emergency are from over aggressively lowering the blood pressure. And these are the different other co comorbidities or different uh, emergencies for which specific treatment is listed. In dissection, the important thing is first to give a beta blocker and then give these drugs in infusion form to reduce the blood pressure. Beta blockers should be avoided if there is severe aortic regurgitation or pericardial tamponade. In acute heart failure or pulmonary embolism, the standard drugs are of course diuretics and nitroglycerin or intravenous enalaprilat. There is only one place where sublingual treatment can be allowed in uh, hypertensive emergency. Encephalopathy and intracranial bleed or stroke, again, as we said, labetalol and nicardipine. Acute MI, as we all know, nitroglycerin, beta blockers or clavidipine, which is a new calcium channel blocker, which has effect on endothelial function. In acute renal failure, dopaminergic drug called felondopam is very, very useful, improves the creatinine clearance and urine flow and sodium excretion. 
in eclampsia and preeclampsia, hydralazine is the best drug. Otherwise, labetalol or nicotipine can be given. In perioperative hypertension, clavidipine, ismolol, a beta blocker, nicotipine, nitroglycerin can be given. Rarely nitroglycerin if the blood pressure is very high. So summarizing, hypertensive crisis is a medical emergency requiring immediate attention. Symptoms and signs of end organ damage suggest hypertensive emergency. Hypertensive emergency should be treated with parenteral pharmacology tailored to the comorbidity. Hypertensive urgency may be treated with oral pharmacotherapy. An ischemic stroke is a special situation. Blood pressure treatment should be slower. Thresholds are higher. In many cases, not treating hypertension may be better than treating in these conditions of stroke, especially. I think that is the end, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Hypertensive was admitted, a 29-year-old gentleman with secondary hypertension was admitted uh, with left-sided weakness. His BP seen by uh, another physician was 180 by 110. He was given some treatment, probably one of them was nifedipine sublingual. And when he presented, his BP was uh, 90 by 60. How, how should we approach this person? Okay, so the patient has come with, there are some situations where stroke patients come with hypotension, whether given nifedipine or not. Of course, nifedipine is almost a banned drug for this condition. I mean, it's a totally, totally contraindicated for stroke. And, but now that you have got the patient with you, the best is to give him intravenous fluids and raise the blood pressure to a level of, say, one. See, in the, in the stroke patients, you know, it's a U-shaped curve. Very high pressures can cause cerebral edema. Very low pressures can cause hypoperfusion. So the best part, the, the sweet spot, is between 150 and 200 of systolic blood pressure. So it, will be, it may be helpful. I don't know after so much period has gone and ischemia has occurred, how much benefit it will occur. But they have described giving drugs like very low dose dopamine or intravenous fluids to raise the blood pressure a little bit, to, at least to a 140, 150 systolic. Would uh, the use of hydralazine be restricted to the emergency conditions or, uh, uh, and not for the follow-up? Because uh, there could be a possibility long-term use of hydralazine can lead to lupus. constriction of arteries. Yeah, and, and main thing is the lupus syndrome that it can give rise. So it is, it is indicated for acute emergency, especially in uh, eclampsia, preeclampsia.